Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination and establishing true democracy. Our guest today is Aaron Brown, co-founder of No More Freeway Expansions. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm happy yeah. to be here. Great. Yeah. So why are you concerned about freeway expansions? I'm concerned about freeway expansions because we all know, as anyone that lives in the Portland metro region, that congestion is absolutely miserable. Our economy is growing, more people are moving here, and people are having a really difficult time getting to their jobs, getting to their kids picked up from daycare, from all of these different things. Uh, and in our community, we are seeing longer and longer commute times, and it's having a significant strain on our quality of life. Uh, and unfortunately, the isn't, there isn't a single example of anywhere in North America in which a city has expanded a freeway and made congestion better. Hmm. So if we are actively looking at this from the what are the problems our community is facing and how do we solve them, it is absurd to be talking about expanding the freeways. It is a 20th century idea to solving our problems and it won't work. We have decades of empirical research from urban planners. There's this concept called induced demand. And it's very counterintuitive. I know a lot of folks think, man, if only there was an extra lane, then all of these cars wouldn't be able to be slowing me down. The notion is, is that the easier you make it to drive and the more lanes that you build and provide for opportunities for folks to take an automobile, the more people decide, oh, there is an extra lane there. I guess I will drive to the Lloyd Center during rush hour commute. <laughs> the problem is, is the next lane you build isn't going to be the lane that stops getting filled with cars. So us at No More Freeway Expansions PDX, uh, we wrote a letter to the city of Portland in particular concern to the proposed Rose Quarter Freeway expansion that the Oregon Department of Transportation, ODOT, and the Portland Bureau of Transportation have been proposing and working through, um, specifically saying this is a solution that has never been proved to actually solve problems anywhere in North America, and we have grave concerns that we should be spending $450 million on this proposal when there are so many other more cost-efficient ways to spend that money that would be more equitable, more better for climate, better for air quality, better for public health, and better for building a prosperous economy for, for the next generation of Portlanders. Okay. All right. So what, what, has, what has been proposed? Who has proposed it? Sure. So the Oregon Department of Transportation has been pushing for a freeway expansion through this stretch, through the Rose Quarter, for decades, at least a decade. Yeah. Um, uh, how, how, how long is this stretch of highway? It's about three quarters of a mile. So, so if less, than a quarter, less, less than a mile. Less than a mile. Mm -hmm. um, and it's from the Fremont Bridge, where I-80, or excuse me, where I-5 meets I-405, um, past the Moda Center and past Memorial Coliseum and the Portland Public School Blanchard Building. It would be that stretch all the way down to where I-5 meets I-84, the band field. Okay. So through that stretch, it goes down to two lanes throughout all of there. And the Oregon Department of Transportation is proposing adding an extra lane and some shoulder space through that entire width uh, with the assumption that it will solve congestion because it is a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And despite decades of empirical evidence suggesting the opposite. Mm -hmm. It is a bottleneck. I mean, anybody who's been on that stretch of road almost any time of day, I, I won't drive it anymore because no matter what time of day it is, you're likely to get uh, According to stopped. the, of course, of course. I mean, I, I live in the neighborhood. I live very nearby. I frequently will drive through there as well as bike under it and take transit next to it. Uh, it is a bottleneck, and according to the Oregon Department of Transportation, the entire Portland metro region is a bottleneck. Like, I am not here to suggest that the person that is spending an hour and a half of their life stuck in traffic, that their experiences aren't valid. Absolutely, congestion is bad, it's getting worse. Part of it's because gasoline is especially cheap right now comparatively over the past decade. Part of it's because we've had an increased economy, more people are moving here. Uh, you've also had the growth of Uber and Lyft and other TNC type organizations that are providing more, you know, putting more cars on the road. What we are saying is that this resource, scarce freeway space, from particular times of the day, there is more demand for it than we can possibly ever supply. Like mm -hmm. we could continue from a ec economics 101 perspective, we could invest hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, and we have. The entire country has, cities mm -hmm. have. And never once have we been able to solve that insatiable demand for free freeway space during rush hour. So our group is saying, 
taking those similar principles of supply and demand and also keeping in mind all the significant negative externalities that comes from people having to rely on single occupancy vehicles to get their basic chores done, why don't we look at other more cost-effective solutions that include congestion pricing and put some of those resources, the $450 million, that's half a billion dollars for one tiny stretch of freeway when we have no belief that it'll actually solve the problems they're proposing. Okay, all right, yeah. yeah and so so what, what, are the, what are the arguments that they use for expanding the, 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 that area of freeway beyond the fact that, you know, it will, you know in theory, relieve congestion, which what the, you're saying won't, won't happen. It depends on who they're talking to. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, when they're talking to downstate legislators and people, so uh, for a little bit of context, the $450 million that would fund this project um, is coming from various tax hikes that came through the transportation bill that was signed bipartisan in the June, in the July 2017 end of the legislative session. Um, big bipartisan vote, $5.3 billion, actually had a handful of pretty good things in there. There was funding for safe routes to school, um, the investments of biking and walking structures and facilities around elementary schools. There was uh, massive amounts of money that went to transit, especially not just in Portland metro where it's needed, but also in some of the rural communities where transit's actually also a significant lifeline mm -hmm. for communities. There were some good things in this package, but the package also included uh, the $450 million to go towards the expansion of this stretch of freeway. So they say it solves congestion, but again, anyone that studied this sort of stuff points it's wrong. The, uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation loves to say that this is a safety fix, that this stretch of freeway is unsafe. Uh, and their rationale on that is that there are numerous bottle, uh, during the rush hour when the ramps are coming on and off, there's a lot of fender benders of cars like bumping into each other as people are emerging. Um, we don't deny that that is true. The city of Portland also though passed uh, a policy saying that they were going to work explicitly for a data-driven approach to eliminate traffic fatalities. This is called Vision Zero. It's a policy that mm -hmm. cities have taken up all across the United States. The idea behind it is any fatalities on our roads, whether people are walking, biking, or driving, is, a, is morally unacceptable. Like these are preventable deaths. These aren't accidents. They are caused because we haven't built the right infrastructure. We've underinvested in specific communities and traffic safety. Uh, you are twice as likely to be a victim of traffic violence if you live east of 82nd Avenue. It's a social justice issue. We have profound implications of when you look at, I believe the number is up to roughly 33, 34 people that have died in traffic violence just on our streets this year. Last year was the highest year of traffic fatalities, 44 in a decade. Mm. This is only getting worse. And we are watching populations get displaced to East Portland that do not necessarily have a car or their families with a lot of children. And they're trying to figure out how to get to their elementary school on the other side of 122nd Avenue, on the other side of Stark, on the other side of Outer Powell. These are streets where cars are going 40 and 50 miles an hour. We don't have crosswalks. We don't have sidewalks. Some of these streets like 82nd Avenue are actually owned by the Oregon Department of Transportation. ODOT had to be sued by Disability Rights Oregon, went through the legal mechanisms to sue ODOT, and they settled to put money into investing into basic safety structures so that people in mobility devices and people that are slower walking across the street can get their safety. ODOT claimed that they didn't have the money for that. Oh yeah. Meanwhile, and these are fatalities, right? These are like very violent, bloody spectacles on our streets that disproportionately harm vulnerable populations. Meanwhile, on this stretch of the Rose Quarter, there's only been one fatality in the last five years, and it was a homeless person that had wandered onto the street. I'm not saying that's no. not a tragedy. That's not a traffic problem. That's yeah. a we need to build affordable housing <laughs> problem. Mm -hmm. um, this stretch is not unsafe comparatively, and the arguments that it is a safety fix goes directly in the face of organizations, including Oregon Families for Safe Streets, uh, their organization of people who have lost loved ones to traffic violence that have come and spoke loudly in charge of Vision Zero, Oregon Walks, Opal Environmental Justice Oregon, the Community Cycling Center, um, public health groups, Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility have all said, if you're actually interested in a safety improvement, there are so many other investments we desperately need to make. Um, ODOT has a litany of excuses that they give of, oh, well, this is, we're doing a seismic fix, right? Um, we know that if an earthquake hits, we need a bridge across the Willamette River. Like Multnomah mm -hmm. County has been like trying to figure out how they're going to fund uh, a replacement for the Burnside Bridge. Um, 
and my, my favorite argument that is particularly like questionable, uh, ODOT has been saying that this project will reconnect the existing African American community that was pushed out of Albina 70 years ago. Uh, I know. <laughs> um, it is undeniably true that in the history of shaping the Portland metro region, um, a lot of our policies and investments and plans around housing and transportation have been thoroughly uh, colored by white supremacy, that urban renewal has been, uh, has had demonstrably negative impacts on our communities of color. The notion that this neighborhood needs a freeway expansion after the significant populations of African American folks that used to live there now live in East Portland. Yeah. It, it's very questionable. Mm -hmm. um, and furthermore, they're claiming that, you know, the, as part of the way of selling this project, ODOT has claimed that there are sig improvements to biking and pedestrian facilities on top of the grid above where the freeway goes, as well as that there are, um, that there's a freeway cap that they're proposing. Um, those are not bad ideas in general, and I'm supportive of ideas to make that area more dense, more walkable, more transit friendly, to have affordable housing, to encourage people from every corner of Portland to be able to live in this centrally located area that's near jobs, that's near amenities. This project, none of the people that stand for those things are in support of this project. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a way of, you know, you can put a lid on it, but at the end of the day, it's still a freeway expansion. And this lid that they are proposing is essentially a park that'll be floating over a six and a half lane freeway with multiple big busy lanes of street. It'll be the most unpleasant public space in mm -hmm. Portland. Yeah, okay. ODOT is <laughs> yeah, not exactly yeah. known for their design of public landscaping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and you know, if, if you wanted to do all those good things that you just talked about, you could certainly do for them for a lot less than almost a half, half billion dollars. Well, absolutely. And um, undeniably, like there's an opportunity to rethink the space of the Rose Quarter to find ways to honor both the historic injustices of racism and classism that brought about what happened in the Albina neighborhood. There's a community group led by some park planners and by, uh, it's called the Albina Vision, I encourage folks to check it out, that involve you know building a lot of new density in the area and, and building affordable housing and building some park space. There are, at the end of the day, there's only so many square feet and we have to determine whether we want to invest in space for cars or in space for people. And mm -hmm. in Portland in 20, you know, Portland in 2017, many folks that live here or moved here, Portland is wonderful because of Portland's laudable history of freeway revolts. Um, anyone that has enjoyed drinking coffee on Division or biking on Clinton is able to do so because a group of concerned citizens got together and said, we don't want to expand the freeway. There was a plan to build the Mount Hood Freeway that would connect from where the Markham Bridge goes all the way out to Gresham and Sandy. Right. Um, a group of citizens saved that, and now it's some of the most valuable real estate in the city. Uh, yeah, and, and it, you know, uh, again with that one, if they had built it, it would we would probably be talking about congestion and how to relieve congestion on that today. There would be expansive exurban growth out in Gresham, and people would be living farther and farther out, more mm -hmm. people, and demanding that we widen the highway through there. Uh, and the folks that live in that neighborhood now would have terrible air quality and children with much more high rates of asthma um, because we haven't because we would have done that um, yeah. similarly the anyone that's enjoyed a walk on the waterfront park the Tom McCall waterfront park mm -hmm. used to be a freeway yes Harbor Drive used to be four lanes of traffic going in each direction and a group of concerned citizens and small business owners and folks involved in the civic forefathers of Portland Portland in the 70s had a lot of crazy radical ideas mm -hmm. and it turned out that those investments and those crazy unorthodox ideas are the reason that people are moving to Portland today. And mm -hmm. I would argue that it's our time to double down on that and continue to move forward on investments that we know are necessary for the future of right. our city. Yeah, and, and having been a Portlander all my life, I, I'm very proud of the, of the things that happened during the 70s and the canceling of the, of the, of the Mount Hood Freeway and the, um, of the building of the Tom McCall Park. It was like two of the, two of the gems Absolutely. Of our I mean, and, and they set the tone for cities across the country. Like yeah. people now are building light rail and are doing these things because of Portland's decisions to do so in the '70s and the proof that it actually works. Mm -hmm. um, I also just want to give a shout out too that you know we have some great illustrious history of of freeway revolts. Um, but we also have some examples where the freeways, of course, did get built. And I'm talking about the Albina neighborhood. Uh, what was originally a thriving African-American community ended up being displaced by the expansion of the Legacy Emanuel Hospital, by the construction of Memorial Coliseum, by the expansion of the freeway. Um, we do have a racist legacy that we need to be considering, and we certainly need to be looking at what the implications of that were and like what that's done to our region now. 
But the only way to solve them is to be moving forward and thinking about, okay, well, how do we provide mobility options, affordable housing, walkable, livable communities that everyone can afford to live in? And any method of moving towards that is antithetical uh, to the idea of spending a half a billion dollar on freeway expansion. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. So you're really talking about what's our vision for the future and uh, saying that that does not really involve uh, using the technology from the past? I would say that, um, so I grew up in Beaverton and one of my favorite things to do uh, as a high schooler, as a, as a teenager, we would go up to Blockbuster Video and rent videos, right? Um, if you and Netflix offered to Blockbuster to sell their company to Blockbuster back in 2007, 2008, and Blockbuster laughed at them. Blockbuster said, oh, we've got a store on every suburban corner in America. You're gonna sell, you're gonna send out DVDs through the mail? You think you're gonna stream them online? That'll never happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And we've seen systemically in a very short amount of time that Blockbuster is bankrupt and everyone I know spends their evenings on Netflix, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm suggesting is, is that as the technology is changing, partially because of, of you know, what is available to us and also based on com consumer preferences and as our demographics are changing, we need to be building infrastructure that moves along with it. And the assumption that the Portland metro region is success is contingent on continued freeway expansion uh, without even doing a cursory study of the alternatives um, is antithetical to Portland's progressive values. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So since the legislature here has uh, passed this package, uh, and made the, the money available, what stops it from moving forward? Citizens, you and me, people, anyone watching this at home on YouTube or, or on television. Uh, the, the fact remains is that this project was, got money, yes, through that state transportation bill, uh, but we also have a city council right now that is going through their central city, their central city plan. Um, without going into too much of the urban planning, technical transportation jargon, because there's dozens of plans and votes and stuff. Yeah. Uh, right now, the city is going through a process where they would consider whether to adopt the freeway expansion into their transportation system plan. Mm -hmm. And if they do not do that, or if they put significant strings on it, if through the process they say, let's look at congestion pricing, for instance, um, and we want to be sure that there isn't any way that we could reduce congestion on this road, for the price of five, 10, 15 million dollars, as opposed to 450 million dollars. Mm -hmm. And if it works, then we suddenly have 400 million dollars that we could spend on transit improvements through the neighborhood, biking and pedestrian infrastructure, particularly in East Portland, uh, buses that run frequently in East Portland. We know the type of investments we need, and we have so much difficulty raising money for it, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, a year ago, I was the campaign manager for the gas tax measure 26173. Yeah. Raised $64 million. Well, barely passed, 52%. I'm proud of the campaign. It's building really important infrastructure that will save lives and be cost efficient investments for the city of Portland down the future. We had to beg for that money. We had to beg for $64 million. We had the oil lobbyists, the Western State Petroleum Center, through $80,000. $70,000, excuse me, to have their lobbyists and send mailers to everybody that we were mm -hmm. raising prices and that Portland couldn't afford this, right? I don't think Portland can afford to have another 14-year-old get hit and killed while she's crossing Hawthorne, while someone's crossing 82nd Avenue, right? Um, it, the affordable housing bond, anyone that's watching this program knows about the housing crisis we are seeing in Portland and the significant impacts this has along lines of race and class and who is going to be a Portland resident in the future. Um, that was $258 million. This is twice that amount of money yeah. for mm -hmm. a piece of infrastructure that doesn't solve its problems. Mm -hmm. And I am encouraging anyone that is fundamentally interested in investing in solutions for climate change, for air quality, for public health, for affordable housing, to say that we have higher priorities than giving the highway industrial complex the opportunity to bulldoze our neighborhood for an extra lane of freeway right below Harriet Tubman Middle School. Mm -hmm. So. Talk talk about the effects of uh, th that this middle school would would uh, have to experience if it were uh, expanded. So Harriet Tubman Middle School, uh, which is a facility that has an illustrious, amazing history as part of you know Portland's African American community fighting back to some of the injustices of Portland public schools. It was part of a demand that they would have an extra middle school. Uh, it was shuttered about a decade ago, I believe, and now as Portland's population grows again and as PPS's population is growing again, 
they are planning to open another middle school in North Portland. So they're reopening Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman is located on North Flint Avenue, which is immediately adjacent to this freeway. Um, Sarah Roth at KGW has done extensive uh, reporting about how many low-income neighborhoods and how many communities of color in Portland have disproportionate uh, poor air quality. We know that if you are raising a kid close to a freeway, and the closer to a freeway, the worse it is, and, and to arterials. Also, we're talking to 82nd Avenue. We're talking to the busy streets that we think of, MLK right out front. Mm -hmm. Your kid is much more likely to have uh, asthma, to possibly get diabetes. We have all sorts of research and indication that suggest that being close to poor air quality from freeways is very, very bad for children's health, for communities' health. And unsurprisingly, the people that live next to freeways are those that can't afford to live anywhere else or mm -hmm. that we've systemically prevented from living anywhere mm -hmm. else. Um, so for us to suggest that this new elementary, this new middle school that will have, of the four schools that are feeding into it, two of them are disproportionately low income in communities of color. These are students that are on free and reduced lunch. These are students that, unlike many of PPS's schools, are majority non-white. They're all going to be feeding into a middle school that right below it is going to have six lanes of cars stuck in traffic, oh. all just emitting bad air quality. And I'll throw on top of that, too, that um, there was an effort in the legislative session this uh, past June and July, Senate Bill 1008, that because, and I, I don't know the full specifics of it, but what I can say is that uh, California and Washington both passed laws that significantly improved and, and put on regulations to prevent diesel engines from polluting in our, neighbor, in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, they tried to do the same in Oregon because they knew that by doing so, all of these companies in California and Washington that have these expensive rigs need to move them somewhere. Right. So they're all coming into our backyard. Mm -hmm. And the freight lobby killed the efforts to pass that, these regulations in Oregon. So our highways are even more unhealthy than in many other of our peer states because the freight lobby was able to prevent that. So living next to a freeway is even more unhealthy here in Portland because of the corporate interests that have been able to fight that. And we're saying that, well, we should expand this freeway. This is the only spot that we have to do it. What a surprise, it's right through, mm -hmm. you know, right next to an African-American or a, a school that will have many students of color, Harriet Tubman Middle School. Mm -hmm. We think that there has to be a better way to be thinking about our congestion problems than okay. solutions that don't work. Right, yeah. Okay, so uh, we have about five minutes, so I want to talk about tolling. Sure. So uh, you, you, your organization has suggested that what we need to do is put a toll on that stretch of freeway or, or some stretch of freeway in, in the metropolitan area. So talk about uh, why you suggest that and what the effect of tolling might be. Sure. Um, I know right now the as an Oregonian, anytime I visit the East Coast and I have to pay toll roads, I'm like, oh, I can't believe it. What is this? Government needs more money from me. No one likes paying tolls the same way no one likes paying taxes. Uh, the research that exists, though, suggests that congestion pricing, having people pay a little bit if they're going to use scarce research or infrastructure uh, during the peak hour, AKA, are you driving to and from work at 8 a.m. or from 4 to 6 p.m., right? Uh, if the people that are using these roads, the basic research that exists uh, here in Portland so far that's been done, Joe Courtright at City Observatory just published something, they are much more likely uh, statistically to make more median income. Their median incomes are much higher. Um, and a lot of the people driving on this route, if you had a congestion toll on there, if you had to pay a buck or two, you might, if you don't have to go for work, if you're traveling to go shopping, if you're traveling to go do another visit that isn't time sensitive, you might move it to a different time of day save yourself two bucks. Or if it's going to charge you two bucks to drive on that road, you could put that towards a max ticket, which by building in congestion tolling, you're creating a source of revenue that could be going into other projects around, around town. Um, what I'm suggesting is, is that I know that there's concerns about equity and stuff. Yes. We have environmental justice, we have economic justice groups, the Portland DSA, Bernie PDX, Opal Environmental Justice Organ, that agree that the implications of expanding a freeway are more unjust than at least studying congestion tolling. Our point is, is we don't even have ODOT willing to study if tolling is more equitable, if it would solve congestion. And if I proposed a solution to could, that could fix congestion tolling at a 50th the cost, if for a couple million dollars as opposed to half a billion, why wouldn't we at least spend a year studying that before moving forward? Mm -hmm. Because if we were able to show, wow, look at the significant impacts to congestion that we can make, it's also going to raise revenue that we could build and put into making sure that our 
low-income communities and, and far-reaching communities have buses that run frequently and have their own lanes so they're not stuck in traffic with the rest of us. We all know we need to be making this shift and there are ways that we can do it that are in fact equitable and that are in fact supporting low-income communities. We just need to have that research and that opportunity which currently ODOT is hiding under the equity lens without actually proving that they have a point. Okay, all right, so, so what, what you want to do is, is put tolling in place to demonstrate that it would uh, reduce congestion and that therefore the lanes would not be needed. If that would happen, we wouldn't spend half a billion dollars on freeway expansion. That would be terrible for climate change. 40% of Portland's climate emissions, carbon emissions, come from transportation. So we, if we're serious about climate change, we have to stop driving less. Mm -hmm. um, and if, even if we switch to electric cars, A, that electricity is coming from somewhere. B, it's incredibly space inefficient as Portland's economy continues to grow and we're having more people fit in. Geometrically, there just isn't room for everyone individually to have their own massive piece of steel that they're using to get around. Mm -hmm. We have transit. We have bike lanes. If we invest in that stuff to an extent that we always talk about expanding in freeways, we can have solutions that people will spend a lot less money on traffic, right, on, on getting to and from. And that leaves more money for people to spend on their housing, for people to spend on their daycare, for people to spend on the resources that are increasingly more expensive here mm -hmm. in Portland. Um, it is inefficient for us to continue moving in this direction. And what we're suggesting is it's absurd that we aren't even looking at alternatives and that we're continuing with this 20th century freeway expansion that's terrible for the environment, terrible for low-income communities, and terrible for the livability that we all cherish here. Okay. So in, in about 30 seconds sure. maximum, what can people do right now? I would encourage people to go to our website, www.nomorefreewayspdx.com. Uh, I would encourage you to sign up. I would encourage you to be emailing your city council and asking them to, you know, Ted Wheeler has, Mayor Ted Wheeler has been a champion, he says, on Portland needing to lead on climate. He wrote an op-ed in the Oregonian saying that Portland, especially with the state of our federal government right now, and with the way our state is unable to pass things like I mentioned, um, I go to our website, email city council, come to some of our events, and show that Portland can invest in things other than freeways. Thank you very much for being here, Honor Aaron. To be here. Thank you. All right, great, good. We've been talking with Aaron Brown, co-founder of No More Freeway Expansions PDX. Uh, keep up with the activities of this group on Facebook at No More Freeways PDX. Have you missed one of our programs? Want to watch something again, or suggest that a friend watch? Well, you can do all of that through our uh, web page. Visit www.populistdialogues.org to view past programs or when viewing a program to sign up for our YouTube Populist Dialogues channel to receive notification when a new program is added. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.